Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, eCognition users and future eCognition users, I hope. Um, this is Keith Peterson. I am the Trimble eCognition product manager, and today we have our monthly webinar with a great focus on using eCognition Server. We're going to cover all the details of eCognition Server and just learning how to go big with uh, data analysis using the eCognition Server product. So if you haven't experienced Server, have some questions about it, this is a great opportunity for you to learn more about it and pick our brains afterwards. Before I get dive right into what is eCognition Server, I just want to remind you of the, I guess, rules of the webinar, if you will. Everybody's on listen-only mode, uh, but you can communicate with us and please ask questions as many as you like. You can use the question field here to submit questions to us. We'll be fielding questions during the webinar. We also have a block of time set up after the webinar to do a little question and answer uh, with you as well. The webinar will be recorded, so if you at any time need to tune out and uh, do something else or break for another meeting, you can access the recording afterwards, uh, no worries, or if we go a little fast and you may miss something, you can watch the recording over and over and see what we've done. We have this set up in, in uh, sort of a two-part um, method here. We're going to talk about what eCognition e Server is, give you some facts and background to that, how it can be used, and then we're actually going to dive right into uh, processing with eCognition Server afterwards. So bear with us. What is eCognition Server? eCognition Server is a part of the Trimble eCognition Suite. So the Trimble eCognition Suite is composed of uh, several products. The, the suite is designed for developing and, of course, uh, for the analysis of various geospatial data types. It's a really a platform for developing and analyzing geospatial data and creating, of course, the rule sets that you need to do this. Um, we have several components that the eCognition Suite is made up of. Primary components, really developer being the heart of it, and uh, eCognition server, as well as eCognition architect. So again, eCognition developer is the development and analysis environment for, for creating these uh, geospatial workflows, these automated workflows, that what we call rule sets. eCognition architect uh, allows you to put a, a graphical user interface around some of these workflows and create an easy to use front end application uh, for the production uh, oriented users. And finally, here, big and bold, you can't miss it, eCognition Server, what we're going to talk about today, is a process environment for the batch execution of various analysis jobs. So if you want to do batch analysis, batch processing within eCognition, you will require this eCognition Server add-on, if you will. eCognition server running options. So there are several ways that you can uh, run eCognition server. Server processing can be run locally or on a dedicated grid uh, machine or machines. Take a closer look at this. What do we mean by local server processing? Uh, first of all, this is what we recommend for a single machine. If I'm using eCognition as I will demonstrate here today, I have it running on my laptop, and I am using a local server for processing. It is very simple to set up, no additional installations, uh, any type of additional add-on software is needed. All you need is a eCognition developer. You don't need any separate server hardware for this. You can utilize the cores on your uh, local machine. And what I always like about it, no administrative know-how is required. So it's really uh, simple to manage by uh, the analyst themselves. So the other type of, of running option here is what we call a grid processing. And the server grid is really recommended for uh, these distributed computing facilities. And within this, you can benefit from high performance server hardware. So that means you do need uh, some external hardware to run uh, the server if you're choosing a grid uh, setup. You can distribute processing on additional worker nodes within the network. So you can really balance how the, how the work is going to be uh, 
going to be processed. And you, one real benefit is you can run uh, any of the processes without any local uh, PC lag time. So if, since it's all the processes are taking place on an external machine or machines, you can continue to work on your computer without noticing any, uh, any lags and, and um, slowing down of, of performance. Ecognition server features and benefits. How can you how can you uh, benefit from the use of server? Um, so let's take a look at some of the examples here. First of all, batch processing. Ecognition server can automatically analyze large scenes as well as large quantities of data. So we can take these. Uh, if maybe it's multiple tiles, we can feed them automatically into your server engine, and then we can take those out. Uh, as a process product, and there are a number of different ways that you can look at the, the process product. In addition, you can add a number of server engines, and by doing this, you can drastically reduce your processing time. So if we look at this, uh, this graph here on the upper uh, right, we can see the, the develop processing time with a single developer. Then if we bring on two server engines to this, we can reduce it to about 50% by bringing on several other, uh, going up to four, we can break it down to another by another 50%. So by distributing the, the workload out, uh, we, can, we, can re we can reduce the time, overall time for processing. Another uh, use case to look at is what we call tiling and stitching. Maybe not the most uh, modern processing approach given the advances that have been uh, going on in, in computing lately, but it's still uh, very beneficial, particularly when you get to those very large jobs. So if you're processing maybe statewide data sets, this could be this could be very interesting. And you can by applying automatic tiling and stitching methods. We will take a look at this later in one of our, our examples. We can we can process uh, data in a more efficient manner. We can load in each tile, and each tile is individually analyzed with on one server engine. Optionally, we can then, after the after the tiling and of course the analysis, we'd have a tiled analysis. There are a number of automatic stitching procedures available within eCognition, so you can take those tiled results and you can actually stitch them back together, and you can look at how you want to handle the uh, scene borders or the tile borders and what and the objects that, that go across tiles and, and a number of different uh, object-based image analysis techniques that you can use to clean up those, uh, those border effects. Scalable processing. Uh, scalable from, uh, we can scale the use of eCognition Server from a single desktop to network production workflows. Ecognition Server is implemented in service-oriented architecture. Uh, this means that this, this allows users to freely add or remove server engines even during uh, while processing is going on. So even when your jobs are running, you can you can come in and adjust uh, the, the the structure. And systems can be easily set up as as needed. So we can go from this workstation using a single server uh, engine, and we can then add multiple server engines onto a single workstation, which we'll see on, on my computer. I'm, I'm going to be running uh, two uh, server engines at one time when we get into the examples in combination, of course, with developer here. And then you also have this uh, network uh, enterprise approach where we have our servers in, in a grid set up outside. They can each uh, grid, depending on the number of uh, CPUs that you have, you can host a various number of server engines there. All right, so again, for accelerated processing, uh, a strong server cluster may be equipped with eCognition server engines, what we see down the lower right, and a developer and server bundle set up on a, on a multi-core desktop machine, on the other hand, can be used as a powerful rule set development environment. That's something I really want to stress here. Uh, it's 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 a wonderful tool when, you, when you're in that development phase of a project to be able to combine the strengths of developer with server. So you can quickly test a rule set approach and then send it to server to try and, and, and test its approach on, on the greater data set itself. So we're, we can also take a look at um, how we can go from subset development work to then applying this to uh, the scene itself. 
Finally, uh, workflow embedding. What do we mean by this? Well, we offer the ability to embed eCognition server engines into um, existing third-party workflows. So no matter whether it's used for pre-processing or say information extraction tasks, eCognition Server can be fully integrated into uh, some of your existing workflows. You can use, uh, for example, the automation API and the system can be set up in a way that all steps from the generation of workspaces to data submission and then of course status monitoring how are my jobs running through server these can all be triggered uh, via uh, or through third-party software so that's that's an important piece to stress is it doesn't always have to run directly through the Trimble eCognition software we can take the, your your uh, packages in a way that's into your uh, current platforms so some eCognition server use cases, um, transferable rule set development. This is one that I was talking about earlier. Besides being, a, uh, being able to uh, go just spread out and do production work, uh, eCognition server is, is really a great asset uh, to increase your productivity uh, during the development, development phase. So you can test the transferability and robustness of your rule set again. I like to develop uh, on smaller subsets. It's very quick. I can do great segmentations, test all sorts of different parameters on the subset in, in, in a quick way. But then uh, it's most important is how is that uh, parameter gonna be transferable to the rest of my data? So by attaching an eCognition server to this, I can quickly send uh, distribute the, the workload out onto server and, and test the robustness and again, transferability of, of my rule set. So, Developer users use eCognition server then to apply rule sets on large scenes over selected areas. That's that's the real key here. And of course, your results uh, you get results, uh, quick feedback on on how uh, how well your rule set is is really working um, over the over the entire area. Automatic uh, production workflows. So in in a typical production workflow, uh, you you create your rule set uh, on these representative areas, so these subsets, at least that's the way I, I really like to work and it's, it's very proficient. Uh, and often uh, an automatic tiling and stitching approach is applied here, allowing the analysis of, again, these very large data sets. You can cut down the data sets automatically with eCognition, so you don't need to uh, pre-create your tiles outside of eCognition and, and bring them in. Um, it's really nice. Exported results are, can be automatically named and stored in dedicated locations uh, when you're when you're doing server processing. This is this is great. It keeps everything, all the all the results, all the work you've done in eCognition in a, in a compact, easy to easy to access environment. And, uh, and then here, the the analysis process can be monitored uh, via HTML based uh, monitor. This is we'll get into later called the job scheduler. We'll come back to this. And of course, you can use the automation API um, uh, to embed these, these into, again, these existing environments. Semi-automatic production workflows. In this, uh, this use case, we're talking about um, in using a combination of eCognition developer, eCognition server, and eCognition architect. So we can run uh, in a first pre-processing step, uh, some type of a segmentation, maybe an initial classification on the data. And then uh, the, the analyzed workspace can be accessed by, uh, say, a production team of users via eCognition Architect, and they can go in and do tasks like manual editing or additional calibrations, maybe some type of uh, quality assurance checks uh, through various interfaces within Architect. And then they can resubmit this after after those steps have been taken, and they can resubmit these uh, these edited workspace uh, to uh, to server for the finalized uh, results uh, and then the export. So how to use eCognition server? That's uh, that's really the big question that we're we're going to get into here. Um, First of all, I want to just cover some uh, some definitions, eCognition server lingo, eCognition lingo, if you will. Uh, we have some unique terms here that we, we need to make clear. Some of them we've already been talking about. So if you're scratching your head saying, well, workspace, what is that? Well, workspace, uh, this is crucial for, for eCognition server. Um, a workspace acts as a container to manage and process your projects. 
you heard me reference rule sets. So if there are any new eCognition users uh, in the audience today, um, a rule set, this is a combination of single processes that make up the analysis workflow. It, this has to be created in eCognition Developer. So that's, that's a, a great combination, the crucial combination of, of developer and server in this case. Next to job scheduler, I mentioned that. That is this HTML-based tool that you can use to monitor uh, job processing. How are my how are my how is my work flowing through eCognition server? Have any uh, problems uh, come up? You can check to see if jobs have failed, if something's hanging, if, if server engines aren't turning on in, in, in the right way or the way you expected. Uh, that can all be looked at via the job scheduler. And finally, uh, I've mentioned this word a couple of times, engine. Uh, what do I mean by server engine? This is simply an instance of an eCognition server software uh, on a processing node. So typically one instance per processor or per core in this case. So that's what we mean by the eCognition engine. Since I've covered the lingo, I just want to take a, a, a short uh, break and see if there are any questions have come up uh, um, before, we, before we move on. Christian, uh, do we have any questions from the audience uh, at the moment? Yes, there's one question. Uh, if the semi-automated workflow, the combination of uh, developer, server, and architect, is it possible for multiple users to access one uh, workspace and edit different projects uh, at the same time? Uh, we have to say here, uh, no because just the eCognition server has the right uh, to write uh, results uh, to the workspace, but users can open the workspace in a read-only mode so that uh, people can check um, uh, if the results are um, done or not done. That means, or in other words, if a project is processed by the eCognition server, no one can edit the, the project itself because it will be overwritten by the eCognition server. But as soon as it's processed, then the user can edit the results in the workspace, of course. I hope this clarifies the question. That's currently uh, the only question what we have in the question tool. Okay, great, then uh, we will continue. So uh, we mentioned, um, did I jump on here? No, here we go. We mentioned that several setups uh, are available uh, for, for eCognition server. The first one I wanna talk about is, is this server grid concept. So setting up the, the server grid. The eCognition grid uh, provides very customizable, so individual installations to support your specific uh, computer environments and it really, it's crucial that the, the, you work with your you, with your IT to manage uh, these this this setup. Of course, our eCognition support engineers can uh, work with you on, on setting things up, but it, it would be very beneficial for them to deal directly with the IT experts in setting up this grid. We can see a diagram in the in the upper upper right here of uh, how, what these grid uh, setups can look like uh, from uh, sort of the the IT perspective behind the scenes. So the eCognition grid installation also includes a unique administration console. Uh, it's fairly easy to use, a web-based administration that allows you uh, sort of, sort of the centralized management of the eCognition server. You can use this tool to add and remove various server instances and set up those, those, those worker nodes, install nodes, and, and this sort of thing directly through this administration console. So again, this is for the server grid. This is where you'd be processing on some type of external machines. It's not the local server. So this is unique just to the server grid setups. And just take 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 a moment to, to soak this in. Uh, it just, it, it requires more management from your IT, but a lot gives you that uh, very customized uh, setup to process and control how jobs are being distributed throughout the network. Next is uh, local server startup. This is, uh, you notice I didn't say setup, there's not much to set up here. It's really just uh, starting and enabling this, this uh, server engine. Uh, this is where each developer actually includes the server engine software. Um, uh, users can enable this eCognition server within developer if they have a, an eCognition server license. So you need that server license to be able to utilize and enable uh, 
uh, the cognition server engines that come with developer. And this is very, very simple. You can enable local a local server. I've, uh, I've put it in, into four sets here. Simply, if there is anybody out there looking how to do this, go to the, the tools menu. You can simply select lo manage local servers. This will open the dialog that we see here on, on the right. And then we were working in the, in the mid section of this dialog. We want to click enable, the enable checkbox. This will initially enable uh, the, the server engine. And then I simply define the number of server engines I would like to use. Keep in mind, if I'm going to use four server, or if I would like to use four server engines, I need to have a license that will allow me to use four server engines. If I define 10 and I only have two available to me, it's not going to do you a lot of good. You'll essentially have two engines uh, that can run and the remaining eight will just sit on idle uh, in the background. So um, that's, that's how this uh, dialogue works here. <clears throat> Then how do we send projects to server? For this, we have to we have to consider uh, I guess some some rules here. In order to process any cognition projects with an eCognition server, the projects must be organized and hosted within a workspace. All right, that's that's crucial. If a project is within a workspace, it can be uh, processed with an eCognition server. If you just have an independent project out there, it, first you'll have to put it into a workspace. Workspaces can contain one or multiple projects. All right? It's not if, if you're just working in one project, yes, you can have a workspace with a single project, but again, you can also have multiple projects within, within the workspace. Uh, the workspace uh, can be populated either when you start creating your initial workflow, you can use various import routines to set up the workspace, populate it with projects, or if you find out later down the road, I've been working in a single project environment, don't worry, we can add existing projects to a workspace so you don't have to backtrack all the way and, and start from scratch. You can either process all or select specific content within the workspace that you would like to submit to server for processing. This is very nice because sometimes, um, particularly if I'm working with some subsets during that development phase, I don't want to just uh, process all the all the material that I've, I've created it within my workspace. I just want to select a few here and there and submit those to server. So again, you have this, this incredible freedom to uh, submit jobs how you how you would like to. Another crucial thing we have to consider is the rule set. Um, it's possible to save a rule set completely within a project. Downside of this is that's not that can't be used then for processing with an e-cognition server. To take a, a project and bring it into and process it within server, we need the rule set to be saved outside of the project as that DCP file. This uh, what we'll see when I when I submit some jobs later on. We reference this. We're, telling the cognition server, here's my data, here's my rule set, use that for processing and give you my results essentially. So the rule set outside of the project. And finally, eCognition server software needs access to the workspace data. This is crucial. Um, it, we need read and write access to your data, particularly if you're working in, in, in grid environments. Um, this is something that uh, you need to consider. Does uh, can I access various grid machines or can my grid machines access the location of my data? Um, if this is a, if you've ever received warnings like this, eCognition support will have you straightened out in, in no time on, on telling you exactly what you need to do and set up the administrative rights so you can get this read and write access. Huh? So here just, um, before we actually get live into the software, here's just a, a breakdown of how we can send projects to server. Again, also very simple. Um, I've got my, my workspace set up here, so we can see that on the left-hand side, there's just a cutout of, of uh, working here in the cognition developer. We have, a, uh, we have a workspace. I simply right-click on that workspace, go down to analyze. This will then launch the this start analysis job dialog, which is in the middle. 
And we come up, just want to check your job schedule or location. So here I've got this 8186 uh, on the local host. I'll, I'll explain the job scheduler uh, differences in just a minute. Four, uh, step four here is, uh, and this is the string to my, uh, to my rule set. So I have to load the rule set into this uh, start analysis. That's why it's important that it's saved outside of eCognition Developer as a DCP file. Right. And then just click start and away it goes and it will start to run and you can then watch the progress in your job scheduler. So monitoring server processing, again, this is done through uh, the job scheduler. Uh, you can open this up. It's uh, an HTML-based uh, platform. Two differences, though, when trying to monitor jobs, we have to consider whether I'm doing local processing or grid processing. If I'm doing grid processing, I have to consider uh, a different URL here. So it's going to be that host name, dot eight one eight four that's that's crucial here when in the URL versus localhost you can simply type in localhost and this is that eight one eight six so again you have your uh, job scheduler for uh, grid processing versus the job scheduler for let's uh, say that local developer processing on a local server just consider those when when you want to access the job scheduler Here's what the uh, job schedule actually can look like. Um, HTML-based status monitoring going on here. We, we provide an overview of various elements um, of, the, of the server processing. First of all, we see here in this user job section, uh, we can get a list of all submitted jobs. So any, any, anything that's in the history of your um, uh, server processing. We can also see a, receive job details here. So we can go in and get the specific breakdown of various jobs. So here I'm looking at individual tiles. You can see the status, whether it's done processing, whether it's still, uh, whether a tile has, has been completed or is, is still waiting in, in the queue for processing. In the engine section here, we uh, an overview of whether the various engines in use and or available so in this case uh, it looks like they have we have two server licenses available um, both are busy so both are being um, being used for processing you can also look at the, the overall workload so here we we can get a sense of uh, you know in the last 60 seconds or the last 20 24 hours the the amount of um, processing that has been going on sort of the, then the memory usage in the end. Jobs can also be canceled. This is important. Just because a job is started doesn't mean you have to wait till the end. You can cancel it from directly here, directly out of your, your job scheduler. So maybe you uh, leave work for the day, go back, but you can still call up the, your, uh, your job scheduler here and you could, you could cancel jobs if, if something came up uh, uh, while, you were, while you were away. This, this is important. All right, so this brings us to the live demonstration. What are we gonna cover here? Uh, I'll get into it in just a second, but before we do, Christian, are there any more questions out there from the audience at this time? There's just a question uh, about um, why the customer cannot see the job scheduler. Um, and I believe you will uh, show now uh, in the demonstration how to start an e-cognition uh, server on a local machine based uh, on the lo local server setup so uh, that then the job schedule will be available. But in general, uh, and here as a general uh, answer to this, you need an eCognition uh, server license um, to, to use the eCognition server. But the job schedule itself should be available if you install the eCognition grid on your dedicated uh, en environment or to start the eCognition engine uh, on your local PC. And I believe, Keith, you will present this now how you can start an eCognition server. That means also the job scheduler for local processing, isn't it? Yes, we're going to cover, we're going to submit jobs to um, a local, within a local server setup, and uh, I'll demonstrate how we can access the job schedule once, once we send those jobs uh, here. So we'll okay. take a look at this in some more detail.
All right. That's all currently. Great. So demonstration, uh, we're going to look at uh, a couple of scenarios here. So some server-based rule set development, we'll, we'll look at uh, options for doing this. Uh, then we're going to take a look at batch processing itself. And then um, an example of this, this tiling and, and, and stitching approach, just because it, it brings up some very nice, uh, unique algorithms uh, within eCognition that we can, that we can discuss. This. All right, so let's jump into this before we get into the axe. You can see I have an eCognition uh, project open. This is open within developer. I have, uh, have a large image here. Um, it's already uh, within a workspace. So my workspace here uh, didn't get too creative with the naming today. It's called batch processing. And here is the project then within this, this workspace. So over here on the left hand side of this workspace window we see the workspace itself any organizational characteristics of that workspace and then uh, within the right side here we get the list of the projects as they appear within the the workspace organization so the first thing we want to do uh, let's uh, look at this concept of of uh, developing with a combination of of developer and and eCognition server. And we can create subsets directly within our, our workspace. These subsets then become jobs, individual jobs within or individual projects within our workspace, which will later then become individual jobs uh, from an eCognition server perspective. So if you're working in this, uh, important to be in this view setting one, this load and, and manage data uh, view setting, this, uh, this will have, include this workspace dialogue here as well as some unique tools that uh, are available when working in within workspaces and when considering uh, eCognition server. So the first one I'm going to look at here is uh, def just simply defining a rectangular subset. You can come to this uh, mid button here, click this, and I can just kind of drag and drop and select a section of the image, click save, and this will then say OK. And I'm going to now save this uh, subset. You can see here within my project uh, window here, that another project has been listed. This is now that uh, subset. I can do this multiple times within uh, the, the workspace. So we'll create another one down here around this golf course, say, okay, there's another subset here as well. And I'm gonna come up into this, uh, this mountainous region here and I'll create another one. So these represent uh, some different, uh, say different areas of this image we have real thick urban areas here. We have some uh, you know, uh, golf course, of course, uh, associated with vegetation. We can look at vegetation elements. And then we have uh, the characteristics of this mountainous region where we'd like to test our uh, the rule set that we've, that we've designed. So I've set these up. Uh, they are now available as subsets here. You can see there's some automated naming that goes on for subsets, subset two, three, and, and so on that you can keep track. Also see the, the state of the project. So at this stage, these have only been created. Um, they, we haven't done any anything within the project. So once you change some view settings and save the project, it, it enters the edited state. Uh, once it's been processed, it'll, it'll, we will see a process state here. So you can also get an indication of what jobs are complete and what, uh, what has not been completed within your workspace. Another uh, really nice piece about working uh, with uh, with the with an eCognition developer and server, particularly within a, in a workspace, is that it opens up um, other opportunities in terms of bringing in in the data. And when we think of bad batch processing, we always think of a, a series of scenes that we want to want to go through. So within this workspace, uh, if I'm in the workspace, uh, the left hand side of the workspace window here, I can actually uh, just right click. And then come down and I'm going to add a folder. So I can add organizational structure to my workspace. I'm just going to give this a uh, name data sets, for example. Enter. Okay. Uh, this organizational section is empty. I want to populate it with some projects. So here, again, when working in a workspace, you have options for bringing in data. This is pretty strong. We have a whole series of predefined import routines that are available to you. So I'm going to use one of these. Uh, what I want is, a, a, if you look at the list, you have lots of 
different options available depending on how your data is organized or what type of data you're using. So I'm going to use this geocoded one file per scene. So this is really great if I'm working with those, uh, say those data stacks. Then I just need to define uh, the root folder. Where is this data coming from? So for me, it's located in this folder that I have called scenes. And I immediately get a preview of what this organization will look like. So if I say, well, no, that's not how my, how my scene should really look, then I, I can test out one of the other predefined import uh, routines. So that's a really nice feature. I like the way this looks. I have scenes one through nine, so I'll bring these into the workspace as well. So now, if I look over on my workspace window, I see because I've set up this structure here, and we can expand the the, uh, the Maricopa folder here. I see I have a whole bunch of scenes within this data sets folder. And if I'm going back to that initial data set, here's my say that my master data file, the one we're looking at at the moment. And then he, from this, I created these scene subsets. So these are then low. Um, referenced underneath this, uh, this, this structure here uh, in a default subsets folder. So here I can then simply come and, and see these three files here. Haven't done any processing yet. That's going to be the next step. And to do that, I'm first of all, just going to close uh, this initial project that we have. And now there's no projects open. That doesn't mean that I lose my subsets or any of my scenes. Those are all still here. You can see here are my subsets here. Uh, here are my subset here. Those uh, those scenes that I uh, they imported. If I click on the sort of the, the overall parent organization here, I can see the the complete content of my workspace. So first, I'm just going to come in, and uh, I would like to analyze uh, these uh, subsets. So you can again either simply right click on uh, some type of organizational subfolder here and go to analyze you can come to the top analyze then everything within your workspace or additionally you can then come in and say well, i'd really just want to analyze and i'm using the, the control key here behind the scenes as i've clicked one i'd like to just analyze jobs one and three for example so again you have an incredible amount of flexibility and how you submit jobs, what jobs you submit uh, to server for processing. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna take the whole batch of these subsets. Uh, at this point, I'm gonna click Analyze. This will then launch the, uh, the Start Analysis Job dialog. I see my job scheduler here. So here is my, my local host uh, address. And then I just want to double check to make sure I've loaded the right rule set. So here's my rule set batch processing. I'm going to say OK. That's why, again why that rule set has to be saved as a DCP file uh, behind uh, or outside of your projects. Once this is done, I can simply click Start. And this should go pretty quick. We see uh, at this point, I'm just going to stay within developer. But we can see the uh, state of our jobs is changing. You can see I'm using two cores here so i'm doing some parallel processing and i see jobs have pro are in the state of processing and now they have processed right. we can then open up one of these jobs and check out the result status so i'm going to just turn off the classification what we've done here is a, our two a two a level classification so we've done a land cover classification here uh, and, and on the base level, and uh, we've combined this then with a, um, a sort of a, a simplified impervious surface classification here. So we're looking at here, uh, these reddish areas are impervious and the, at, at several levels, and then we have other non-impervious, or we have just split this up into impervious levels one through four here. Right. And close this out, these are finished processing. Another nice option that you have here is to come back and uh, you can roll back the status of the processing. And then this gets back, as you can see here, it's my, the state of my project has gone from processed to, to created. So I've essentially cleaned the slate, come back and said, okay, things worked, maybe they didn't work. Uh, I'm gonna go back and, and go into another another iteration of, of rule set development and do some testing here. 
We also have this uh, this folder that contains a series of of projects here. So let's take a look at this. Uh, on this end, we I can take this whole data sets piece here, and now I would like to analyze just the whole batch again. I always double check to make sure I have the right rule set uh, loaded here. And I'm going to take this batch processing rule set here. And I have my local host IP uh, or URL. One tip for me is just go and control C, copy that out. We can press start. We'll see here the jobs uh, will be in a waiting phase. And then I can go into my web browser. I'm going to refresh this. See here, job 19. Uh, this is what's currently running. It's processing at the moment. I can come in and see that here are those nine tiles uh, or nine scenes that I want to process. I'm working on two of them uh, right now, and the remaining uh, jobs are in a waiting phase. You can again click these, get a, a lot more detail about each job. For example, what is the rule set that's being used? Uh, the various input layers, if there's some type of output. So here's the location of the actual project file here. I can get all that information directly within this. Come back, I see, oh, two have already completed. It's moving on to the next two. It's also nice, we can, we can take a job here. And so let's maybe say number five, uh, it's, it's still in, in a waiting phase at the moment, so we can get that. I don't know, now number five is running. Actually come in and, and cancel some jobs directly from here, or we can cancel the whole batch of, of processing at this stage. So I'll, I'll take this, I will cancel the processing. You can see I don't need to let the, the remaining jobs run in this case. And I can come back now into developer. And I can see it it mirrors the state that I was able to monitor from the job scheduler. So I went into job four. We'll take a look at this. Did it really run? Here are my results for this particular job. Right. Another nice thing to notice is, is the rule set's not currently loaded uh, within this, but you can certainly take a rule set and just drag it in. It's not going to hurt anything. What we have set up here, for example, is just some customized view settings. So I'll execute this. And we get just get a nice sense of what were the results uh, that we were we were running in this particular folder. All right. So this is uh, just showing various options for you know being able to flexibly work with uh, the subsets on the, so creating these subsets on the fly, how you can submit those and, and do work to test your rule set robustness. And again, using that rollback function, you can get back to the, back to this, uh, the original uh, created state and, and consider other options. And then also how we can do batch processing in general by loading in here, using a predefined import, bringing in a series of scenes in, into, into the developer and, and sending those off to the Cognition server. All right. Another nice thing to show is it's, it's also real easy to get uh, projects out of, uh, of server. So I can simply click Press shift, I could uh, just like to delete all of these scenes and I can just go click delete and it will ask me if I really wanna do this, yes. And you can see then I can remove that content from, from the workspace as well. Okay. Christian, have any uh, questions uh, come up while I've been running through the batch processing uh, example here? Um. Yeah, there was a question if you can uh, still show us how to start a local server uh, inside the eCognition developer environment. You presented it in the uh, PowerPoint presentation, but if, if possible, if you can show it here in this environment, the different step needed uh, to start the eCognition server environment uh, with the eCognition developer software. Sure, we can we can look at how to start and uh, manage the, that server. It's a great question. So uh, again, we come into the tools uh, menu here and simply uh, come down to manage local servers. It's down towards the bottom. Come here, and this will launch the manage local servers dialog. 
I can see at the moment I, I my local service are already enabled. Uh, typically, when you open this up, I'm just gonna it'll, it'll look something like this. So uh, you want to then enable the server. So again, you just simply click on enable, and by default, we'll we'll turn on one server engine. If you have multiple server licenses, you can of course define how many of those you would like to. Uh, enable in this step here. So I will take two of my server engines here and then I can say OK. And once you do this, uh, if anybody's ever wondered what the sort of these little stoplights uh, symbols look like down in, in the bottom here, uh, this is one on the left is if we just hover over it with the mouse, we can see this is an indication that my engine server is running. It's also a nice convenient way to quickly get back into manage local service. So if I double click that, I can open up uh, this, this management dialog again. Any other questions before we, we move on uh, with the demonstration? No, not yet. Thank you. Right. Excellent. So what we're going to look at in, in the second part of the demonstration is a tiling and stitching routine. And you can see I've already set up my, my workspace called Tile and Stitch. I have this, uh, this image again within, <clears throat> within the workspace as a project. And this time though, I've, I've loaded the rule set. I, I've just loaded the rule set so we can, we can take a look at it here. When uh, the uh, unique part about tiling and stitching is that when we use this, these uh, type of rules, we, we include algorithms uh, that we call workspace automation algorithms within eCognition. And these can simply be used to say, how do you want to manage and, and work uh, with the data in the automated environment? First one we have here is simply, uh, we're just creating tiles. So create scene tiles. I've defined uh, the width here in pixels. And the second piece, uh, which is for me the more, more interesting one, is an algorithm called submit scenes for analysis. And here you have a number of different options, the type of scenes. So in our case, these are tiles as opposed to subsets or copies. And then we can define what, where is, what are the uh, steps? Where are all the, all the rules or the rules that are located for what's going to happen on the tiles themselves? So that here is this, then this process name section I've defined. It, anything that's involved in, in any of the, individual process on each tile will be located in a, in a tab within my, my process tree called on tiles. You then have the option uh, of doing stitching if it's, if it's something that's not interested then of course you can leave the set to no. By having it set on yes and I get uh, a couple of uh, subsequent post-processing options that, uh, that are available. First of all do I want to do post-processing yes or no. If I have it set to yes I again get another tab available within my within my process tree that contains all the rules, all those uh, algorithms that will happen on the stitched results. So in this case, I've just given it a name, on stitched. Um, this helps me. I know that this tab contains everything that's going to happen on the stitched results. We can take a look at this. Here are those tiles. So we have our main or excuse me, our, our, our tabs within the, within the process tree. We have the main tab. That's one we're all used to working with. Uh, we also have one called aisles. Again, that was where uh, sort of the meat of the analysis, if you will. This is what we're going to be doing here. So we've got a number of different uh, algorithms set up to run and doing segmentations and classifications on each individual tile. On the stitch results, we can sort of take a look at how we want to address various um, border effects or uh, anything that's going to happen on, on that stitch result. And of course here, uh, if I'm working with tiles, typically I don't need to keep the individual tile projects. Once I've stitched my results, we can think about how we want to uh, save space. We can delete those tiles once they've fulfilled their purpose. Right. So that's the rule set we're going to use here. Now uh, we can close out this project. Don't worry, we're not going to lose anything. Remember, our rule set is saved outside the project. And now I can simply come into this workspace. I'll take the workspace as a whole. And we want to then come to analyze. This time though, I'm going to change my rule set now to the tiling and stitching rule set. Say, okay. And working on that uh, local host here. And I'm going to start 
my analysis. The first thing you're going to see is that magically, boom, uh, a number of projects appear here. So we have our tiles, we have a unique tile name set up with an e-cognition, and we can see these tiles have not only been created, but we've immediately started uh, processing here. So we're, we're working on uh, the first a few tiles here, and let's now go into the job schedule and take a look at uh, what this is looking like here. Oh, sorry, refresh. So I see now this is my job 20. And if I come over here, I can expand all the details that I want uh, on the various projects. And I then here, my individual tiles. So I can see tiles one, two, and three are done. Four and five, or four is processing, and while five is, is licensing, it's waiting for uh, one of those server engines to, to free up. I can look down here and I see, ah, yep, here are my two engines that I defined while setting up my uh, local server. They're both busy, working hard at the moment. And we can continue to let this run until all the uh, pieces have completed. So we can also see that there are a number of jobs waiting here in the background. And of course, the, the stitch is also uh, waiting here in the background as well. So again, let's refresh this. Now I can see that all my jobs have, have completed and the stitch processing in, is taking place at the moment. And again, we can open up those details. Take a look at the rule set that's being applied here. If we go into the show log, we can get additional details on uh, our server processing that's going on. So particularly, you can see here, for example, a long time ago I had a job that failed, um, must have had something not set right in that rule set, and I can use this uh, detailed log session, section to go through and identify where a problem uh, may have occurred during, uh, during the processing. So we can come back here, we'll refresh, and we can see we're still waiting on this, the final stitch to take place here. While we're waiting uh, for the stitching results to, to come in, Christian, are there, are there any more questions uh, from our audience uh, today? Not yet. Okay. Then we'll just wait a few moments while these, uh, these, the stitching result uh, gets, gets processed, at which point you'll see then, since we have that, that last call there was delete tiles, uh, we're going to come in, voila. Uh, speak of the devil, so to say. Uh, we see that our tiles have been delete, my, deleted. My processing has been, been completed on the full scene here. I'll double click it, open up this, this project, uh, take a look at our classification results here. So we've applied again the same uh, rough uh, impervious uh, surface classification in the combination with our land cover classification for this scene. And all those results that have been submitted as individual tiles have been brought back together and stitched two together. And we can zoom in, let's take a look if there's any tiling results uh, down here. And you can see that we have just these, for these are a result of that chessboard segmentation that we did in, in, the, uh, in the other level. But um, to do the impervious, impervious surface, uh, calculations, uh, but other than that, there are no uh, tiling uh, artifacts here in this this particular analysis. All right, that uh, completes my demonstrations for today, and I'm looking with the cognition server, and we're just going to go back into into the PowerPoint because we still have some important information to to cover. Uh, first of all, uh, ecognition server facts. Um, Yes, use of eCognition Server requires a, a license for eCognition Server. All right, so they, unfortunately, can't get around that. Uh, the server can run in both Windows and Linux environments. So if there are there any Linux uh, users out there, you, you can host this in the Linux environments as well as on Windows servers. Uh, you have multi-core support. So one CPU supports one server license. Uh, if you want to utilize four cores for processing, this will require four server engine licenses. 
Nevertheless, uh, there are algorithms and processes within eCognition that utilize up to eight cores. Even with one server engine license, you can still spread this work up on up to eight cores if they are available and it will be done in parallel. Okay, so for example, a multi-resolution segmentation will spread out onto eight cores while it is being called and then go back to the, to the single core for the remaining other processes. Okay. Uh, we're often asked, well, what is the, uh, is the system requirements? If you go into our documentation, we now show minimum uh, recommended and, and, and optimal. So I'm showing optimal uh, requirements for recognition server here. Um, hexacore, CPU speed, uh, 32 gigabyte or more in, in memory, and a hard disk of uh, you know, at least uh, 512 gigabytes and, uh, SSD card. So uh, those are just some of the, the straight out facts uh, that we want to consider on eCognition Server. To summarize uh, eCognition Server, well, it's, it's again a software um, that provides processing environment for, for batch execution. Uh, we can do the batch processing uh, of, our, of our jobs here with eCognition Server. But uh, with eCognition Server, we can also quickly develop transferable rule sets. We can easily process large scenes. We can batch process vast amounts of data um, and, and send that through. Uh, we, can ha we have administration consoles that we can use to monitor uh, the processing via the job schedule. It, it, you have a lot of options of how you want to scale your system. Of course, we can embed uh, these server engines into those, uh, those third-party existing workflows. Finally, uh, there are also some, uh, some nice server bundles available. If anybody's interested in, in looking at those, uh, again, please reach out to our, our sales team. We can combine eCognition Developer with a, a, a single eCognition server license. There are also bundles if you want to bump up to two eCognition server licenses, four eCognition server licenses. Those are also available. And uh, again, if you're interested, let us know. You can contact sales. There's a contact sales form on our website that you can use to get that information. Now I'm going to hand over if there's any more questions that have popped up that we can we can feel those now. If not, then uh, we're we're closing our hour here, so uh, we can we can maybe even make it out on time this, this, uh, during this webinar. Christian, uh, does anything come up from the audience? Uh, currently not, not specific. I'm. Let's wait um, some minutes or two minutes uh, if the customer will uh, ask question just a second oh there's an interesting question is there a, a speed advantage to processing um, with a single server license versus a single developer license um, Keith it's okay I would like to answer here yeah there is a speed advantage with the single server license you can uh, run the analysis in a batch mode. If you're just using the eCognition developer, you have to create a project, uh, uh, open the project, load the rule set, execute the rule set inside the developer, waiting for the um, processing uh, until the results will be exported and doing the same for the next uh, data set. But with an eCognition server, what Keith presented, you can execute um, the analysis of several data sets in batch mode over the night, uh, over a break or things like that. That means uh, from the speed uh, perspective um, with the server, you can process faster because there are no manual interaction needed to load the data and load the uh, rule set and execute the rule set. Um, then there is another question. Is it possible to use GPU, uh, graphical processing unit, uh, for calculations? Keith, maybe something for you. Sure. So uh, GPU uh, calculations uh, are currently supported within uh, our deep learning algorithm. So uh, for the uh, convolutional neural network uh, processes uh, can utilize a GPU at the moment that uh, those are the algorithms that are that are gpu enabled i will say 
that's right. And also uh, some open CV algorithms, what we integrated um, here, uh, I think here supporting also some GPU processing. But please note, if you uh, execute this on a server environment uh, where no uh, nice graphic cards are available, then all your GPU support is uh, not uh, yeah, meaningful. Uh, in this context, the local server processing is uh, much better because on the workstation, people have often a really good graphical card. So let's take a look if there's another question. Uh, currently not. Maybe we wait some seconds. To just mention though, if, if you do have questions that, that come up after the webinar, something that you saw, you thought of a little later, um, I'll, I'll show you the address. You can contact our support team at, at any time and ask them uh, questions of, that, that you didn't get a chance to ask here or you, know, you were re-watching a webinar and, and have a question later. Please uh, don't hesitate to contact uh, our support team and uh, they, can, they can get answers for you pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Ah, there's one last question. Here's a question. What is the eCognition server package? I believe this question comes from our download portal because we are offering here the grid installation package uh, and the so-called eCognition server package. This is a very special package um, to upload a new version to an existing grid installation. Very specific use case and um, uh, so that you do not have to uh, install a new version of the grid. Uh, in, you can also just upload an older version or a newer version to an existing grid installation. And uh, we haven't showed this. During the submitting of a project, you can also define which eCognition version has to be used for the processing. That means if you are, have already uh, created an eCognition rule set based on for instance, eCognition version 9.3, and you're using this in a production mode, and you don't want to check it if it's running in version 9.4 or uh, upcoming versions, then uh, during the submitting, you, submission, you can say, hey, please analyze this specific uh, uh, data set or the amount of projects in your workspace with a specific eCognition version. This is handled, uh, or you can handle this with an eCognition grid installation. Very special. You uh, need the eCognition server package just if you want to have uh, backward compatibility uh, in your production mode. All right, then I think uh, that brings us uh, virtually to the, the close of our, our hour here. And uh, before we, we say uh, goodbye, I just want to remind everybody again, all our webinars are, are recorded and we, we make them available on our YouTube channel, eCognition TV. So if uh, you want to access these videos as well as a lot of other great eCognition video material, for example, our eCognition, eCognition Deconstructed video series, these are all available from uh, our within our YouTube channel, eCognition TV. You can uh, go and uh, watch these over and over. You can subscribe to it and they, get uh, notified of, of latest and greatest updates on material that we're loading there. So please check that out. And finally, uh, to bring things to a close, and again, just thank you for coming in and then uh, taking time out of your day to, to watch our webinar. And if you have any of those questions that come up later, uh, please contact our support team uh, that's support at ecognition.com, or you can go directly to our website, www.ecognition.com, and you can gain access to the support portal directly from uh, the website. So that being said, uh, I hope you all have a great remainder of your day, and uh, we will see you during the next webinar. Take care, and goodbye.